with our PowerPoint presentation that we where we left off last night. So aeronautical decision making. Okay, just kind of a quick overview of what we talked about yesterday. Talked about DRM, human factors, and how they play a part in our uh, in dispatching and how we can kind of overcome them or counter, uh, you know, things like stress or situational awareness or things of that nature. So, so decision making is a big part of what we do, right? Um, we covered that slide yesterday, but, um, here's some of the things that we're responsible for. So aircraft familiarity, you know, there's a reason why we go over systems in this class, um, so thoroughly is because even though we're not flying the aircraft, we need to know some of the quirks of, or, uh, some of the different consequences if things go out of service. You know, I've, uh, I myself have had times where I haven't fully understood um, what an MEL meant and how it was implemented. And, uh, you know, we got to ask questions and, and make sure we understand uh, all the intricate details of the aircraft because we are that's part of our responsibility <clears throat> physical condition um you know being healthy plays a, a big part in our stress and uh, our well-being oops uh knowing routes destination airports charts and knowledge um super important and that's something that comes with times time you know we don't expect, you know, uh, people to to know when Grand Junction, the JNC VOR is out of service, you know, that that takes down multiple um, approaches due to it being part of the missed approach procedure. So if there's no published missed, missed approach procedure with JNC being out of service, then you know, expect higher landing minimums, things like that. I mean, that that all comes with time, and that's, that's all part of the learning process. A lot of that you're going to learn while you're on the job. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's something that comes, you know. Knowing airport configuration, San Francisco liked, likes to land on the 28s, take off on the 1s, things like that. I mean, it's, it's all stuff that you uh you learn as you go along so weather conditions you know, understanding the implications of what the di different weather systems might do to the aircraft or to the flight or even the route of flight so and then air traffic control delays and preferred routes so we need to make sure that we're up to date on on all that information and making good choices there because you know that could cause serious problems for for our flight um, you know if we haven't planned for the extra fuel that it's going to cost to to do the air traffic control reroute then we may be diverting because of a fuel emergency things like that so All part of our decision making every day. So whenever we're making a go no do, go decision, we need to assess or assess the the risk elements, right? So the pilot you know, looks at the situation, um, and us in operations need to be looking at the situation as well. Um, how's the aircraft going to react in the situation? All things that we need to uh, take a look at, and then the environment or weather. So, so 
to make these good decisions uh, and use our good judgment, we need to, you know, gather enough information, process the information, and and take a look at the performance. So, um, you know, as far as steps and good judgment, really being vigilant, like we talked about yesterday, it's easy to get sidetracked or to um, get lackadaisical or stressed out, um, but staying vigilant and making sure that we're being thorough on every flight is going to uh, separate us from being a good dispatcher and being a great dispatcher, right? So, um, so finding problems, you know, finding problems and, and figuring out the diagnosis, uh, how to how to fix those problems. Sometimes we've got to use our dispatch resource management. Go to our supervisor. Go to other dispatchers and uh, gather information to help you make that good choice. Um, what does it mean, do you think, by alternative generation? So, you know, just <clears throat> honestly, I don't know that I fully understand alternative generation, but when I hear that expression, I think of, you know, um, looking at people with experience and uh, using them as a resource. <clears throat> um, looking at people that have, have been through different situations and, and allowing them to help you understand or, or make good judgments. So, um, identifying background problems uh, decision and action. So, so how do we learn this uh, good judgment? Lots of instruction, being willing to learn, um, gaining experience. Don't be overly cautious. You know, there's a point where there's cautious and overly cautious, right? Um, finding that that boundary and 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 staying cautious, not overly cautious. And then alternate means, you know, looking at simulators, computer-based training, classroom training, loft roller role-playing, all parts of uh, learning that good judgment. So the two parts of improving our judgment, detect, recognize, and diagnose, right? So that's the first step in, in solving a problem, is detecting that there is a problem in the first place. And then once we've recognized the problems, diagnosing it, and then determine an alternate course of action, uh, then we always need to assess the risk that's involved with doing that. So attitude, um, you know, staying motivated, choose uh, and execute suitable course of action, action or no action. So attitude, big big part of our judgment making or judge judgment making uh or decision making i'm sorry and uh you know when we when we talk about our attitude we we talked about it a lot yesterday but a bad attitude can completely 
change change our course and and change the results. So here's that decide model that I was talking about yesterday, the acronym. So the D represents detect the fact that a change has occurred. Then we need to estimate the need to counter or react the change. Uh, to the change, and then choose a desirable outcome for the success of the flight, then identify actions to successfully control the change, do the necessary action to adapt to the change, and then evaluate the effect of the action. So, you know, a little bit more about, about it, just basically the same information you saw on this last slide. So our attitude action or no action. So sometimes no action is more detrimental um, to solving a problem. And sometimes acting when you shouldn't be acting is a big bigger problem, right? So if we don't fully understand what we're doing and we're making choices on our flights. Say we have a question about an instrument approach plate, but rather than going and asking our supervisor, we just go, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. You know, that no action could be detrimental to the safety of the flight. So knowing when we need to take action and when we need to hold off is, is extremely important. Um, types or attitude, types of attitude. Um, negative and positive. Um, I noticed, well, I talk about my military days a lot because I, I definitely learned and learned a lot in the military. But uh, you know, growing up, I um, I always had this attitude that sometimes life sucks and I just you know I get all upset and down on myself and you know, different things <clears throat> but I went into the military and uh, and one thing that I quickly learned um, watching people get uh, dropped, you know, when we say dropped in the military, we talk about people, you know, doing mountain climbers, push-ups, you know, burpees, whatever, um, because they mouthed off to a drill instructor or did something stupid or did something incorrect. You know, the thing that I learned at that point is my attitude. I, I determine the outcome, whether or not I'm the one that has to whether or not I'm the guy that's constantly getting dropped because I'm being stupid or being the guy that, you know, never gets dropped because I make good choices and staying positive and trying to help others around me. Um, there was one time and one time only that there was, you know, I should have been dropped. Um, and in basic training and I had called one of our petty officers by his, uh, when you, when you say petty officer, that's, um, uh, you either say petty officer or petty officer Kirkland Smith was one of my, uh, what people called drill sergeants. <clears throat> and, uh, his nickname when he wasn't around, was Smitty. 
and uh, you know, had we been equal rank or even sailors at that point, I'm sure it would have been acceptable to call him Smitty. But we were, you know, piece of crap recruits and hadn't earned, earned the privilege of being able to call him by his nickname. So I called him Smitty one time on accident. And uh, luckily at that time, um, we were just getting ready to uh, start our PT. And he's like, go get your shit on after PT. Um, I'm going to drop you, you know. And so I... I ran, I got my PT gear on and we did PT and a lot of people um, would have taken PT really, really easy because they knew they were getting dropped after, after PT. Um, so a lot of guys just kind of take it easy because they know that they're just about to get their butts kicked and they, so they want to, cons, you know, conserve some of their strength. But, you know, I made the choice. Well, you know, it's, I'm, I'm going to take this positive and I'm going to, I'm going to work my butt off this PT and push myself harder than I've ever pushed myself. And, uh, you know, I, I was doing all the calls and you know, staying positive and working as hard as I could to the point where I was like about ready to collapse. And uh, right after PT was over, I ran and stood at attention in front of his office and, and waited for him. And uh, he came out and he's like, you ever call me Smitty again, I'll kill you. <laughs> he's like, but good job at PT today. Yes, sir, Petty Officer. Ran away as quickly as I could. Um, you know, so just staying positive plays a big part in the results of, of our decision making. I know that story was probably a little long and, and drawn on, but it's one thing that I, I work with my kids a lot, um, especially is, you know, your attitude is 100% of what the environment around you, how the environment around you is going to respond. My one daughter, she's super explosive and you know, chews out her other sisters and yells and screams. And, and uh, I have to constantly remind her, well, if you want your sisters to be nice to you, you need to be nice to them. You know, positive attitude play, goes a lot further and a negative attitude. So, anyways, yeah, just <clears throat> you know, what are the effects of attitudes? Exactly what I was talking about: jobs, self-esteem, you know, money, commitment, all, all big effects of, of our attitudes. Some hazardous attitudes uh, we talk about. Yesterday we, we talked about these, the anti-authority and vulnerability, macho, resignation, impulsivity. <clears throat> so anti-authority, you know, don't tell me what to do. Those are the guys that were always getting dropped in basic training. You know, just follow the rules. It's super simple. I learned really quick, you know, if you just do what they ask, they're not asking you to do anything difficult or something they don't think you could do. If you just do what they ask, you never get in trouble. <laughs> so uh, you know, be smart. 
um, and a vulnerability. It can never happen to me. There's always a possibility that it can happen to you, right? Uh, macho. Um, you know, sometimes being macho is a bad thing to where we we take those chances and you know it's kind of like the famous last words of the south uh, has anybody heard that one famous last words of the south is hey y'all watch this that's that's that macho attitude <laughs> hey y'all watch this but uh resignation uh no control over my fate I can make a difference is your your antidote um, and then impulsivity just do it no think about it make sure that you're you're going through all the different options before we're making a, a choice So improving the attitudes of dispatchers, you know, attitudes can be modified, uh, but you can't change personalities. Um, you know, don't let people get under your skin. Notice there's a lot of people out there that are completely different from you. you may like things that that drive you up a wall or how we react to them is, is going to make a difference in our relationship and having a, a positive attitude. So, you know, as far as just relationships versus ta uh, tasks, be assertive. Don't be aggressive. Don't be passive. Don't be passive aggressive. Be assertive. Um, that's part of that clear, concise communication. And then work as a team. You know, delegate to others, ask for assistance. When you need help, make sure you're asking. We're all there in it together, so. And that concludes our... ARM and DRM. Okay, so um, why don't we take a 30 minute lunch break, jump back on at 12. Well, let's take a look at it. So this was a <clears throat> Alaskan flight, of course, but it was a MD-80. It was flying from um, somewhere in Mexico, uh, Puerto Vallarta, up to, uh, I can't remember where the, oh, Seattle, Tacoma. So <clears throat> they were flying up from, from there and what happened was basically a there was a maintenance issue and um, we sat there and argued over it tried to figure it out doing troubleshooting while they were in flight it ended up causing more issues and they ended up crashing so um so it crashed about two and a half miles from Anapac, or Anacapa Island in California. So just off the coast of California, kind of close to uh, L.A., actually. Um, all the passengers, the two pilots and three crew members were killed. Um, and it pretty much obliterated the uh, aircraft on impact. So some of the things that we uh, learned from this 
Um, gosh, this is so bad how this PowerPoint's put together. Um, so some of the things that, that happened were um, the pilot um, had just got to his cruising altitude and he was about two hours into the flight and uh, they contacted dispatch and maintenance control and told them that they were having an issue um, controlling the aircraft. Um, they said that they had a jammed horizontal stabilizer. Remember, this is the control surface uh, on the MD-80. Um, you can see that um, this entire surface can actually move here um, on the tail of the aircraft. Um, and what was happening was it was jammed. And so, um, let's go back one here. So what happened was maintenance told them uh, to do a couple troubleshooting items. They pulled what they call the pickle switch um, and, or I'm sorry, uh, they pulled the, it's called the suitcase handle. And what that's supposed to do is, uh, basically unjam the, the horizontal stabilizer. Um, but as soon as they pulled that, uh, they went into an extreme nose down position, forcing the aircraft into a dry, uh, into a dive. And they went from about 31,500 feet to 23,000, uh, between 23 and 24,000 feet in about 80 seconds. So that's, <clears throat> what, that's like a 8,000 feet per minute dive. Uh, oh, 6,000 feet per minute uh, dive. Both pilots struggled together to regain the control of the aircraft um, and only by exerting a pulling force of about 130 to 140 pounds were they able to basically level out and stabilize at about 24,400 feet. <clears throat> so um, they told maintenance control, hey, that's a bad idea. And uh, maintenance control said, well, you know, maybe you should divert to LA, you know, and good luck, basically. Um, after they told them that, um, air traffic control uh, started working with them and they told this Alaska Airlines flight, um, they told LA Center that they were going to, they needed basically a block of altitude to try to figure out the problem. Um, and so they blocked out altitude, uh, an out, it was like a 10,000 foot block. Um, from about 10,000 feet to 20,000 feet, where no aircraft, they, they moved everybody out of the way. Um, so, um, so a couple minutes later, after they blocked out the altitude, uh, in the cockpit, voice recorder uh, picked up the sounds of at least four distinct thumps followed by 17 seconds later, an extremely loud noise. Once again, the aircraft rapidly pitched over into a dive. Um, let's 
Several airplanes in the vicinity contacted air traffic control and told them that they were in a dive. Uh, one pilot radioed that the plane has just started into a big, huge plunge. And another reported, yes, sir, I concur. He is definitely in a nose down position, descending rapidly. Um, but that's when they crashed shortly after that. So this is just kind of a map um, of the incident. So, so this is when they pulled that suitcase handle, um, and about five seconds later, they went into that that dive. They reported, "We've lost vertical control of our airplane." Um, what about? 45 seconds later, and uh, about 20 seconds after that, they said that they had it under control. Then they went into another dive, and er, I'm sorry, they reported that it really wanted to pitch down. So remember, they had 130 to 140 pounds of uh, force to keep that thing stabilized. Both the pilot and, and uh, co-pilot were um, pull them back, trying to maintain that, that vertical control of the aircraft. Um, they reported we have a jam stabilizer and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. Um, you can see LA right here. Um, they deployed their flats and slat, slats. They said it's pretty stable. And as soon as they brought their flats and slats back up um, and were about ready to start their approach into L.A., um, that's when that loud noise happened. They went into that final dive, and, uh, and that's when they crashed. What they found was there in that horizontal stabilizer, there is a um, a jam nut and this threaded um, like screw, basically. Uh, the or I'm sorry, they call it a a jack. What is it called? Jack screw. Um, <clears throat> so they found that 90% of the threads in the Acme nut had been previously worn away and completely sheared off during the accident. Uh, once the threads failed, the horizontal assembly was subject to aerodynamic forces and could, or that it could not withstand and ultimately failed. So, what it came out to be was that Alaska, uh, their maintenance, one of their uh, tasks was to lubricate that threaded assembly and the jack screw, um, and they had failed to do that. Um, So, kind of scary. <clears throat> um, so, they fix the jack screw on the rest of the aircraft. Um, Let's see. An 
any other big things. So there's the, the sundial is for, this is right close to where the crash happened. It's just a memorial to them. Um, So some of the things that came out from this um, were uh, the troubleshooting in the air. Really bad idea. Um, rather than trying to fix the problem in the air, we need to get the aircraft on the ground and get it fixed there, right? When we're in, in the sky, um, it's really... It's really hard to to see the problem and understand what's going on. Or as if they would have uh, just landed the aircraft rather than try to troubleshoot it, you know, maybe things would have turned out a little differently. Um, you know, part of that was they're talking to maintenance control. Maintenance control was trying to talk them through a, how to troubleshoot it, how to fix it in flight. Uh, but anyways, so we're going to listen to the actual um, communications with Flight 261. Um, but here we go, just a second. General Alaska 261, we are uh, in a dive here. Alaska 261, say again. Pitch. Alaska 261, say again, sir. Yeah, we're at a 26,000 feet. We are in a vertical dive. Not a dive yet, but uh, we've lost vertical control of our airplane. Last 261, are you? We're at 237 request. Uh, yeah, we got it back under control there. No, we don't. Last 261, uh, say the oxygen you'd like to uh, remain at. One zero five strike, quick direct ocean side. Alaska 552, the center maintain level 240. Center maintain level 240, Alaska 552. Alaska 261, say your condition. 261, we're at 24,000 feet, kind of stabilized. We're slowing here, and uh, we're going to uh, do a little troubleshooting. Can you give me a block between uh, 20 and 25? Alaska 261, maintain block altitude by level 200 through by level 250. Alaska 261, we'll take that block, we'll be monitoring the fleet. Uh, Alaska 261, you over here with me yet, sir? Yeah, like Delta X, we do have that airplane quite high and up at 1 o'clock. Zero Delta X-ray. I just kind of keep your eye on him. He's having some pretty bad problems up there right now. As far as we know right now, he doesn't have any intent to go below 17,000. Keep your eye on him, okay? Go to Delta x -ray. Thanks. Hi, Zero Delta x -ray. That plane has just started to do a big, huge plunge. A big, huge plunge. Uh, thank you. Skywest 5154. The MD-80 is uh, one becoming about 2 o'clock, about 10 miles. Now, another pilot reports he's really looking pretty bad. They're heading you right. Do you see him? Yes, sir. Uh, I concur. He is uh, definitely in a nose down uh, position descending quite rapidly. Okay, very good. Keep your eye on him. Alaska 261, are you here with us yet, sir? American 161, you can proceed direct to Denny now. American 161. Army 5004, contact center on 119.05. 1905, video, sir. Please invert it, sir. Okay, very good. It looks like he's turning out, turning over in front of you now, Scalas 5154. You still got your eyes on him, sir? There is. Uh, definitely out of control. Okay, very good. Yeah. Yeah, he's inverted. He's, okay. Just, uh, just do what you need to do there, Scalas 5154. Keep us advised. And he just hit the water. Uh, yes, sir. He, uh, yeah, hit the water. He's uh, down. Okay. And for position, I'm right to beam him by the Delta X-ray. Yeah, we, we, uh, he 
just now hit it. We have the spot marked right here. Thanks, guys. American 161, contact center on 126.52. 26752, American 161. Center, he's about uh, two and a half miles off the end of Anacapa, just uh, towards Point Lico. Okay, he's about two and a half miles off the east end of Anacapa, was it? Sir, that's affirmative. Actually, he's at the, uh, the northeast end, probably 030, heading off Anacapa. There was a boat that doesn't seem to be turning around right next to him. Uh, Roger, that uh, zero delta x-ray, do, do you still see the spot right where it went in? So I hope everybody heard that. Could everybody hear that pretty well? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty tragic. Um, you know, some, some of the things that, that happened. Um, can, let's see, does anybody, um, can anybody identify some of the attitudes we may have seen, um, during that as far as like Identifying maybe some of those hazardous attitudes that we talked about in human factors. You know, something. It's it's really hard to to say. Um, that the pilot did anything wrong there because it's a, uh, you know, it is tragic what happened, the outcome, but you know, maybe, maybe the whole, um, you know, I can control this. This is, you know, we've got, we've got that, we've regained vertical control. You know, we're good. I'm going to go out and troubleshoot this. You know, that, that may have been a little bit of that macho attitude. Um, it's hard to tell, right? But, um, you know, I've, I've read the actual transcripts from the cockpit voice recorder and the communications with maintenance control and dispatch. And there's some, there were some definite issues of, of, uh, breakdown in communication um, and um, you know it's pretty sad that that that's what happened um, like I said before a lot of that we just need to get the airplane on the grip on the ground where we know it's safe um, in that case we need to to definitely move them or, you know, get them diverted to the nearest suitable airport. So. Um, yeah. Let's see here.
So I'm just trying to find this. Uh, yeah. So did you guys hear the in that transcription the um, Sky West? flight you guys hear him yeah he yeah he was the one that actually identified the location of of where the crash happened so let's see so we're gonna watch this video on um, American Airlines Flight 1420. This is the one that, uh, if you remember me, if you guys remember me talking about uh, the bowling alley approach, this is this is the investigation. So. Um, let me get it pulled up here. So this is kind of like a simulator um, with uh, narrations. Um, it's, or I'm sorry, uh, subtitles, but it does a good job of showing, you know, giving you visuals and everything of, of the what was going on um but everybody pull this video up and watch it and um once we're done watching it, it should be 9 45 or i'm sorry 8 45 um and we'll jump back on on and we'll talk about this this flight so
Alrighty. So, what were some of the things that you guys saw with that? I mean, a lot of it was the cockpit voice recorder, but it just seemed really unorganized. Yeah. There wasn't really a, a clear thing. Stuff was constantly changing. Um, yeah, so kind of a couple things that led up to this were, one, both pilots were coming up on the end of their duty time. This was the last leg of a very long day. Um, they knew they were going to be encountering weather at some point. Um, and they were both pretty tired, right? So, uh, while they were in flight after they departed and were on their way to Little Rock, the dispatcher contacted them via A cars and said, Hey, just a heads up, you know, you got thunderstorms to the north, thunderstorms to the south, and it's like a bowling alley approach. If you're going to make it, you've got a very small window. So when the pilots got there, you know, they couldn't see the field. They had troubles. They did a couple circles. I mean, they were taking too long as is, right? Um, another thing that may have contributed to it was, uh, you know, the one of the things in the investigation was the pilot was kind of antsy to get into Little Rock because he had a girlfriend there waiting for him. Um, so he didn't really want to divert. I mean, Little Rock was his destination. Come hell or high water. So what were some of the attitudes that you guys saw that this pilot exhibited? I didn't get the impression that he was very confident um, in this particular approach. Okay. He seemed pretty determined to complete the task instead of considering an alternate. Yeah. What about his crew resource management? What do you think, you know, how he handled that? Well, I, I felt like his co-pilot, like when he couldn't see anything, he was like, you know, it's right there. I see it. Don't worry about it. But his co-pilot was like, no, I, I don't see it. And he just kept on telling him it's there. It's there. And then kind of listen to, they weren't on the same page, I felt. Yeah. Huge communication breakdown, right? You know, even when they were on the runway or right when they were on final approach. The co-pilot even asked for uh, if he needed help one more time. It's like, you got it? You know, pilot's like, I got it. There's been really interesting studies done in other countries where they have uh, formal and informal vocal, like, reflections. Like, where formal and informal, like, language is a part of their language. And that it's, like, a huge cause for miscommunication because using the formal for a captain by a first officer prevents him from making any command. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a lot of that attitude of, you know, stay out of it. You're the co-pilot. You're, you're my first officer. You don't have the flight time that I have. A lot of that has really been curbed over the last couple of years because of, you know, this accident and a couple others like it, where the pilot was just like not even willing to consider what the uh, first officer had to say. Wasn't willing to to take any advice from the first officer or even even attempt to listen to him, you know. 
or allow him to help. It's like, no, I got this. This is my, this is mine, you know. Um. Which is also pretty hazardous, right? Not relying on on the people there to to assist you and help you. Um, one of the things that they didn't do on this landing, so they they knew that it was a contaminated runway. They knew that there was standing water. They knew that there were several issues going into Little, Little Rock, right? One thing that they failed to do was deploy their spoilers, right? What did the spoilers do? Reduce, um, oh my gosh, is it the reduced drag? In, in, uh, they in increase. increase drag, yeah. Sorry, increase, I meant reduce, yeah. So, Reduce lift, increase drag. So basically the spoilers, when they land, the spoilers will pop up on the wing and it basically kills all lift. Uh, so it really helps stabilize the aircraft on the ground when they're at high speeds and slow them down quicker. Um, and they didn't even, didn't even deploy the spoilers, right? Um, kind of a big problem. Another thing that they didn't do or even consider was a go-around. You know, they were obviously struggling to keep control of the aircraft going into the airport. Let alone when they touched down, why didn't they just throttle back up? No, it was like, Nope, I'm stopping this plane right here on the ground. Um, pretty bad attitude to have. So the dispatcher was put on trial in the NTSB investigation. And they wanted to know why did you describe the approach as, as a bowling alley? And you know, he talked about it and defended, you know, this is... I only have a limited amount of information. What I see, the pilot can't can't see necessarily. And so I was trying to make it as clear of a picture of what the weather looked like around Little Rock. And a bowling alley is as close of a thing that I could come up with. And everybody knows, you know. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but... Um, you know, they also wanted to know, why did you tell them to hurry up? Well, well I just told them, if you're going to make it in, if this is where you want to land, then you need to expedite it, because if you don't, you're going to be stuck in the storm, and that's a bad thing. So, anyways, the dispatcher, they, they interviewed him. Um, asked him dozens of questions, um, trying to, to understand how a dispatcher works, basically. And the uh, thing about the NTSB is a lot of them are either pilots or have never flown, <laughs> never, never been in the cockpit. It's kind of funny. And so the investigation kind of, they asked a lot of the same questions and chase their tails a bit. But uh, you know, as dispatchers, it's, it's important that we're relaying that information as clear and concise as we can. The dispatcher had done his due diligence. They found him you know, not guilty of any recourse or reprimand, so. <clears throat> um, but as dispatchers, we need to make sure that we're, we're staying on top of our flights and providing them with as much information as we possibly can. 
so good, good, good. All right, so that pretty much finishes up all the required course material that we have. So, last week I gave you guys some legal to go practice. I believe it was worksheet number three, correct? Not hearing you very clearly here. Um, was it worksheet number three? that I assigned you guys for legal to go? Was that like a weekend assignment? Yeah, this last weekend. That legal to go. I wanted you guys to look at. Last Friday, let's see. Okay, even put it in the Google Drive. Yeah, so I wanted you guys to. We did. We did uh, number two in class. I signed number three, but anyways, we'll just go over number three now, and uh, and then I'll give you guys number four. But we're gonna start hammering these practical dispatch applications tonight. We're gonna do this legal to go, and then tomorrow we're going to do <clears throat> um, weight and balance. I'm gonna teach you guys how to do weight and balance for an aircraft. So. Let's see here. All right, so this is legal to go worksheet number three. Um, what is the first thing we need to do when we're looking at these legal to go worksheets? Pull up the Jepson flight chart and see what the minimums are for that specific airport. Yep, for this specific approach, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we're going to look at um, Phoenix ILS or localizer approach runway seven right. So let's go to our flight planning material, Jefferson charts, and we'll pull up Phoenix here. So. So is, this is the chart, right? Remember up here in the corner, we have Phoenix, Arizona, ILS or localizer runway seven right, okay? So what are our minimums? What are we looking at for our minimums? Terps area, straight in landing, seven, runway seven right, ILS. Okay, good. So our minimums would be what? Is it three quarter of a mile and three hundred? Is it three hundred feet? Would you round it up? 
Yeah, we rounded up. Exactly. So 300 and 3 quarter, right? So let's go into our lesson plans. Week 5, day 5. And we'll pull up this worksheet number 3 again. Actually, hold on. All right, so we got 300 feet for our ceilings and three quarter mile for our viz. So what are we looking at um, when determining legal to go? Visibility statute miles. Exactly. So our visibility, that's the only thing we're concerned about. So are there any lines in our TAF that are below our landing minimums and would not be legal to go? Yes. So which one? The first line is a half mile, half, I mean a fourth statue mile. And then the tempo line is a half statue mile. The second tempo line. Are we on the same one? Oh, sorry. I'm, I might be looking at the wrong worksheet. So legal to go worksheet number three. Number three, KSAN? Nope, Phoenix. Oh, I have that as worksheet number three. I'm wrong. Ignore <laughs> me. No, both of them are labeled as number three. Oh, my bad. So I did both. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> sorry. So Phoenix, runway seven right. I need to fix that, but. <clears throat> so we've got this second line here, right? So from 10Z on the 12th. Alrighty, so we know that we need to pay special attention to this, right? So our ETA is 9 Zulu. So are we legal to dispatch at 9 Zulu? Let's see here. Cody. At nine, uh, no. So at nine Zulu, where does nine Zulu fall? On the second. Right here. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it would be the... Yeah, it would be that one, wouldn't it? So what time does that forecast start? The 21st, oh, no, I'm, I read that wrong, I'm stupid. No, you're good. <laughs> so, so this is from the twelfth at yeah. Zulu. Okay, so this is when this line starts. So nine Zulu, we look at it one. would fall on that one. So at nine Zulu, are we legal to dispatch the flight?
Yes, sorry. You're good. So yes, we're legal to dispatch because our visibility is three statute miles at our ETA, right? Okay. So are we, or do we require an alternate? So what is, how do we determine whether or not we need an alternate? One hour before or after ETA <coughs> and 2,000 feet, three miles. Yep. Okay. So what is our ETA window? Zero, 08 Zulu. <coughs> 10 Zulu. Okay. So that being said, um, Cody, I'm going to go back to you. Are we legal or do we require an alternate at that point? Yes. Yes, we do. So that 10 Zulu, the end of our ETA window, falls right on that line. Had it been, had our ETA been 8.59 rather than 9 o'clock, we wouldn't have technically uh, required an alternate. But because our ETA is at 9 Zulu, we fall into this next, this second line here. Okay, so yes, we require an alternate. Good. Okay. All right, so let's move to the next one. Liz, your ETA is 1055 Zulu. Are we legal to dispatch this flight? No. No, we are not. And why? Um, the closest reporting at 10 uh, has a half mile of visibility. Right, so at 10 Zulu, from 10 Zulu to 1459, the visibility is expected to be one half mile. Our landing minimums for this approach are three quarter mile, 300 foot ceilings, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so do we even care about this? Do we require an alternate? No, we do not. No. Well, yeah, no, we don't because we're not dispatching the flight. Right. So if we were to delay out this flight, when would be the next possible time that, that we could, you know, legally it would, dispatch? It would be delayed until 1500. Right. Until our ETA, our estimated time of yeah. arrival, fell after the 1500 Z. Mm-hmm. Good. So, let's see. Eric, your ETA is 1115Z. Are we legal to dispatch this flight? Um, 11.15. No, because it falls on the second line. And it's only half mile statute, half uh, statute mile visibility. Yep, exactly. So this falls in the same same category as that one. It's not legal to dispatch. We don't care if it requires an alternate, right? <clears throat> okay, right. good. So Jeff, what about seventeen Zulu? Um. We will reference the third line down at 1500 Zulu because that would be effective mm -hmm. at this point. And we are legal to go with one uh, statute mile visibility. Good. However, we've got a uh, overcast layer at 300 feet. But again, we're just looking at the visibility, correct? Correct. Okay. So then we are legal to uh, dispatch flight. 
Good. And do we require an alternate? Um, yes, because of the uh, overcast layer at 300 feet. Yep. And also the uh, one mile of visibility, right? So both Correct. of those require an alternate. Good. Okay. So next one. Let's see, Carrie. Uh, your ETA is 21 Zulu. Are we legal to dispatch the flight? So that would that would fall on line number four at 2,000 hours on the 12th. You've got three quarters statute mile visibility, so you would be legal to dispatch that flight. Good. Good. So at or above our our visibility on landing, um, yeah, we are legal to dispatch. So even though it's three quarter of a mile, it still falls within legal to go. Good. So do we require an alternate? I'm going to say yes, but I don't. Um, I'm not 100% sure why on that. Okay. So what are the requirements for, for an alternate? Remember, we always have to put an alternate on our release unless one hour before or one hour after the ETA. We have at least 2,000 foot ceilings and three miles of visibility. So since we're oh, okay. under, that's, yeah, that we're under, we're under three miles of visibility. Yep, we're under three miles of visibility. We're also under 2,000 foot ceilings because it's broken right. at 1,800 feet. So okay. yes, we require an alternate. Good. How's everybody feeling with these? Is is everybody comfortable with them? Yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah, because this is like number one in our job, right? It's just determining this. Um, going to save yourself a lot of time, a lot of heartache by being able to do this quickly and efficiently when you're out actually dispatching flights. So, so I'm going to give you guys another practice here. So I don't know why that was labeled number three on the Google Drive. Uh, no, it's labeled number four. Oh, I didn't change it up here. Okay, I see where the error was. So, if you haven't done number um, number four, do that tonight. Um, I'm going to post it in today's. Google Drive. Wait, sorry. May 30th. All right. Okay. So everybody do that one tonight. And we'll talk about it in class tomorrow. Um, anybody struggling with any of that, let me know. Um, and I will do my best to, to help you guys out. Something else that I'm going to, well, that'll probably be good. I'll hold you over. Um, any questions on any of the tests? Uh, anything we covered tonight?
Can you email that to me because my computer is special and won't oh, download it? That's right. Let me see here. That was uh, Cody, right? Um, let's see here. All right. Well, if there's no other questions. Jared, I've got a, a question regarding schedules and the ADX. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> after going through a couple of tests, I'm thinking I probably need a little more study time, which is going to take me into next week. Um, okay. Knowing that those tests have to be scheduled in the morning. Um, missing class to do it. Um, any suggestions there? I mean, how, how is that best handled? So you're, you're going to be missing uh, some of next week's class? Well, just, just to take the ADX if I reschedule. Okay. Um, That, it's a little harder with next week's classes. Um, you know, it's fine if, if you miss a day. Just um, it's going to be a little hard to. What we're going to do next week is. Uh, are you available in the mornings at all or? Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I'm planning on attending all of the classes with the exception of scheduling, you know, trying to figure out when to schedule the ADX, when that's going to be best to do if I don't take it Friday, this coming Friday. Right. Um, would you... And hopefully this will be helpful information for others. Yeah, so would you be able to make it to any of the class, you think? I don't know what times they they run the test. Well, it usually runs from 8 o'clock until I think the last available time is like 11. Somebody else might correct me on that um, because it's three hours and they close up like 2 o'clock. Oh, okay. So here's the, where the confusion is. So the actual in-class time will still be 5.30 to 9.30, right? Oh, are we not in class time? In My information originally from uh, eight until five for the final two weeks. Is that what Adam said? That's what all of our um, introductory email said. Oh, I'm not going crazy then. Thank you. And then the first night of class, Adam told us the time of class was different online as well as the time of class in person. It sounds petty, but I was really upset that I had to stay a half hour extra each night because I had spent a month with that not in my brain. <laughs> it sounds like I need to have a talk with Adam. 
sort of a <clears throat> reminder as to what the next two weeks is going to be. <laughs> so the next two weeks, technically the class time is still 5.30 to 9.30 as far as I have always worked out with Adam. Um, that's how we ran last class. During the daytime, when I'm off work, which will be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we can run basically all day if you if we need to. Or we can just sit there and do flight plans and go over material. <clears throat> but as far as like the actual in-class time, that what days did you say? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So those are my off days from SkyWest. On the other days, I can start as soon as, you know, uh, on Monday and Friday, I can, I work from uh, 5 to 3. So I could, at 3.30, I could meet up with people and start going over material. But as far as... Uh, The eight to five. This is the first time that I'm hearing of that. So I need to talk to Adam and see if he's planning on flying out here or what. He told us during the first class that it was the same, you know, the same 530 to 9.30. If I remember correctly, he said that he would have people available to work with us throughout the day if we wanted that. But yeah, yeah. class time would be 5.30 to 9.30. Yeah, I wasn't aware of the change, so thank you for that clarification. So are, is that okay with your schedule, Rex? Or Yeah, it, it'll be fine. <laughs> I just, uh, <clears throat> no, I know I have all day long, any day next week to be able to. Yeah. Is anybody available during the day to create a study group for the ADFs? Oh, I've blocked out those two weeks completely, put vacation on my schedule so that I'm not going to be in the office, so I am. Yeah, I'm available the whole time I'm there. That's great. I, I, I thought as well. I was going to have class all day, <laughs> so now I have all this time to study. Yeah, just so you guys know, this flight planning portion, there's, you're going to need to spend a lot of time doing the flight planning too. So um, it takes quite a bit of instruction to make sure that we're, we're doing flight plans fast and efficiently. But at the same time, yeah, you know, use this time to study for the ADX. Um, You know, it definitely needs to be priority um, from now to the end of class. <clears throat> so, yeah, next week, like I said, Mondays and Fridays, I'll be available starting at um, at three p.m. at three thirty p.m. Um, Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, you know, whatever time you guys want to get up and, and start going over stuff, I'll be available. But um, the actual in-class time um, is 5.30 to 9.30. So we, I'll be available as much as possible. I've really, you know, tried to to be as open as I can to being there but uh, I I have a couple of my uh, former students that have also said that they'd be willing to come and help out with the flight planning so um, we'll make sure that's all coordinated and you guys are getting plenty of face time uh, over the next two weeks but Yeah. And I'm really sorry for the confusion. Um, 
I'll talk to Adam about it and make sure we get some clarification there. Well, obviously it was talked about and it was my fault for not tuning in on that particular paragraph. <clears throat> but, uh, it actually will work out better for me for being able to prepare. Good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, questions or concerns? And you recommended that if we don't take the ADX by next week to put it off until after the second week of class, is that correct? Yes, I'm gonna say yes to that. Um, this flight planning portion is pretty intense as far as like cramming your brains full of information. Um, but at the same time, if you guys feel like you can take, I'm not going to tell you no, don't do it. But at the same time, it's highly recommend that you devote as much time as possible to learning and understanding the flight planning portion. But if you need to take the ADX, then that's completely understandable. Um, so it just depends on how quickly you're picking up the flight planning portion. Will, will this flight planning help us uh, toward answering a lot of these questions that have to do with the flights um, for the ADX? Mm, not significantly enough to hold off, you know. It's, there's some of the things are going to be covered that are in the ADX, but I wouldn't hold off taking the test for the flight planning portion. Um, just simply because, you know, it's, it's not going to directly pertain or help you in the ADX. Um, some of the things you're going to see in the flight planning portion, like I said, are going to be on the ADX, but it's not really going to help you all that much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anything else I can? All right, then we'll call it a night. Um, see you guys tomorrow.